Welcome to part one of the Volcano Notes, and we're going to break the, well, obviously it's part one, so we're going to break these Volcano Notes into two different segments, and it's not going to be easy to break it quite in half with the slideshow that I have set up, so we're going to get to a certain spot, we're going to stop, and then you're going to have to finish up part two. You should have to fill in a blank notes if you're in class and you're taking these for my class, and as always, when the presentation gets done. If you have any questions, just ask me in class the next time you see me. And obviously it says volcano, so this is on volcanoes. Now before we get into volcanoes, I want to talk about some of the more famous volcanoes that we've had in history. And one of those famous volcanoes is Vesuvius. And we're going to talk about what happened in Pompeii. On August 24th, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted. And this was a sudden explosion. Now, people, Vesuvius has been active for a while, so people knew something was going on, but they didn't necessarily know that it was going to erupt at that time. And Pompeii, which was a city near Vesuvius, actually got buried by all the ash, by all the debris. And for many, many years, many centuries, Pompeii was lost. People didn't know where it was because it was completely buried by this volcanic eruption. And what was very interesting about it, if we look at this slide here, what, what do these figures look like? They look like people, right? Well, what had happened was archaeologists were digging and, and around Vesuvius, and what they came across were these cavities. So when they were digging, they, they would dig, and then they'd find this cavity, this void. There's nothing there. And someone finally had the bright idea to pour some plaster of Paris or some concrete in these cavities. And once that hardened, they dug out everything around the cavities. And what they found were these lifelike, almost like statues of people. So what archaeologists, what scientists figure happened is when Vesuvius erupted, the people around Pompeii, they were probably knocked out because of the gas. The gas cloud came down, they probably suffocated, and then the ash buried them. And all the soft tissue that you know, your skin, your fat, your, your muscle, eventually over time it broke down, but the ash hardened around it first. And so they have these neat, um, almost like statues again. And if you go online, you can find all kinds of different um, pictures of these. There's pictures of dogs, uh, fruit, different things that would have been um, broken down over time and basically preserved by the ash. Krakatoa. You know, if, if you think you like rock and roll music, if you like to crank your stereo a little bit loud, that's nothing compared to Krakatoa. Krakatoa quite possibly made the loudest noise in history. When Krakatoa erupted, it was actually audible. You could hear it 4,500 kilometers away. That's 2,800 miles away. And there was reports of sailors in the area. And the, the report said that these sailors were 15, 20 miles away from Krakatoa and the sound was so loud it actually blew their eardrums out um, or you know popped their ears so it didn't literally blow their eardrums out but it popped their ears and so Krakatoa quite possibly the loudest noise in history was a volcanic eruption now this is interesting right here if we take a look at it um, let me grab a pen here so let's go red pen so when we look at this right here, what this is outlining, this used to be the island, Krakatoa. And basically it was one giant volcano. And when it erupted, all this stuff in here was wiped out. It was just blown away. <coughs> Excuse me there. Uh, another eruption that has an interesting history is Mount Pele. Mount Pele, found in the Caribbean, it, it was on the island of Martinique erupted May 8, 1902, and it killed 29,000 people. And it was a pyroclastic flow that killed a lot of the people, and it basically buried the city of San, San Perry. And one of the interesting things about it is there weren't very many survivors at all. In fact, there was only one survivor reported, and this person was actually half happened to be a resident of the strongest structure in town, the most fortified structure in town, and it happened to be the jail. And a person that survived, ironic as it is, was a murderer. 
and this was his 15 minutes of fame or he might have had a few more minutes of fame because he actually toured with the Ringling Brothers Circus after this as a as a sideshow as an oddity the only person surviving in, t in the town of San Paris how many of you have seen this movie about Atlantis you know there's all kinds of myths about Atlantis and what happened to Atlantis and where did it go well volcanoes might have had something to do with the demise of Atlantis and again it's we don't really know much about Atlantis did it really exist did it not really exist it's kind of a legend out there one of the theories was was that maybe Atlantis was actually the Minoan civilization and when this when we look at the map down below here you can see this is the island of Sandorini sometimes it's called Thera this is in the Greek Isles so it's below Greece there's lots of islands down there and when we look at the island itself it looks like it should all fit together but it's actually two separate islands well a lot of geologists theorize that this once was a giant volcano and it erupted and this might have met the demise of Atlantis or the Minoan civilization so here's just a quick look at a, a couple more famous volcanoes that have erupted over time and then caused a lot of, lot of damage uh, Tambor in Indonesia in 1815 uh, 92,000 people died you might say well that's a lot of people it is a lot of people did they all die as a direct result of the volcano no a lot of times it's the things that are caused by the volcanoes that kill people for example here it was the starvation um, Krakatoa we already talked about that in 1883 a giant tsunami killed a lot of the 36,417 people that they estimated had died uh, Mount Pele we just talked about 29 over 29,000 Ruiz Colombia 25,000 um, Japan 14,000 so again you, you don't necessarily see the cause of death is the volcano itself the eruption itself but it's the tsunami it's the ash flow it's the mud flow that happens as a result so what is a volcano a volcano basically is an event at the earth's surface through which magma which is your molten rock and gases erupt and come through now vents are the openings in the Earth's crust from which molten rock and volcano, volcanic gases escape into the ground or into the atmosphere. And here you see a geologist, you know, he's up close. It's probably going to be a little warm there, but he's fine. He's actually doing some research. Now we've often talked about magma and lava. What's the difference between the two? Well magma is molten or partially molten rock beneath the Earth's surface and geologists call that magma once it reaches the earth's surface they call it lava so how hot is this lava well this lava can actually reach anywhere from 700 degrees celsius to 1200 degrees celsius and we'll talk a little bit more about specific temperatures when we tar start talking about the different types of magmas that come out of volcanoes now a pyroclastic flow is one of those things it's an oddity that I would like to talk about and here you can see in this picture all this ash hot gas flowing down the side of the volcano so ash does not always get sent straight up sometimes it's heavier and when it comes up it's gonna flow downhill down the sides of the volcanoes now these pyroclastic flows it's basically an avalanche of hot ash pumice rock fragments volcanic gas and it can rush down a volcano as fast as 100 kilometers an hour or more. And the temperatures within these flow of hot ash can actually be temperatures greater than 500 degrees Celsius. So if you're caught in one of these, you're not going to survive. The hot air alone, once you take a breath in, it's going to burn your lungs. Now, what do we call the study of volcanoes? It's volcanology and if you are a scientist and you study volcanoes or things related to volcanoes you are considered to be a volcanologist now volcanoes can be active which means they've erupted sometime in recorded history and I've seen different accounts of this but one of the numbers that I've run across quite often is somewhere between 500 and 600 years so if a volcano has erupted in the last five to six hundred years they consider it to be active um, dormant volcanoes could still erupt and extinct volcanoes no longer are a danger now it's quite possible that a volcano could have erupted less than 600 years ago but it might not be considered active anymore if a volcano is considered to be 
um, not capable of erupting again, they, they consider it to be extinct. So there's a lot of volcanoes around the world that are active, a lot that are dormant, and there's you know signs that there might have been extinct volcanoes once, including here in Wisconsin. There's remnants, you know, if you go up to Rib Mountain, they a lot of geologists theorize Rib Mountain is the foot of an ancient volcano. So it wasn't the volcano itself, but it was part of that structure. So that's some evidence that at one time Wisconsin might have been a land of many volcanoes. So here we see a map of the world's volcanoes and as always it's a lot of them are located around the Pacific Plate. Now we've already talked about plate tectonics. I know you got the Filipino plate in here. You've got other plates in here but we've talked about plate tectonics and here's your Nazaka and your Cocos plate and your Juan de Fuca plate up here. But we've talked about plate tectonics and this is the Pacific Plate. We talked in our last unit about lots of volcanoes. Actually, it's part of the same unit. It's on earthquakes and volcanoes. But we talked about a lot of earthquakes being here because of the constant interaction between the various plates. Well, it's for that same reason that you have a lot of volcanoes here. And early on, you've probably learned that they call this outline where all these volcanoes are and these earthquakes are. You've probably learned this is the ring of fire. And they call it the ring of fire because there are so many volcanoes there. Now, when we look a little bit closer at the United States, we can see that this is part of the ring of fire right in here. So here you have your plate. Pacific plate is over here. North American plate is over here. Then you got a smaller plate called the Juan de Fuca plate. And the Juan de Fuca plate is, is probably what's left of a much larger plate called the Fallon plate that mostly have subducted underneath the United States already or North America. And it had a lot to do with the creation of all these volcanoes in here. And so we do have active volcanoes in the United States. We have quite a few of them. Um, do they always erupt? No, but we do have them. So within your lifetime, we may see some major eruptions, including maybe another major eruption of Mount St. Helens. So what causes the formation of volcanoes? Um, heat and pressure is going to melt rocks in the mantle. And the, this less dense rock is it's going to be less dense because it's heated and this less dense rock will start to slowly rise to the surface and if it can make it all the way to the surface and it can make it through events it actually can form a new volcano. Now volcanoes are not randomly distributed over the earth's surface. We've, we've talked about the plates and the edges of the plates and this is where you're going to find a lot of volcanoes. You're going to find them along island chains, such as Japan. We talked about how the Japanese islands were created. They were created because of plate tectonics, and they were created because of these volcanoes. These volcanoes helped to create Japan. Now, more than half of the world's active above sea level volcanoes encircles the Pacific Ocean to form the Ring of Fire. We saw the map of that a few slides back. And in the past 45 years, scientists have developed the theory of plate tectonics. And this theory of plate tectonics really helps to explain why volcanoes are located where they are and why earthquakes are located where they are. It helps explain a lot of geological features and processes um, that have occurred. So here's just another slide of a lot of the um, volcanoes around the world. So again, here's your Pacific Ring of Fire. But one thing I want to point out while we are on this map, there are several locations where we seem to be getting volcanoes that aren't on a plate boundary. Here's the mid-ocean ridge, so that's why we see a lot of volcanoes there, including the ones up here in Iceland. So where do volcanoes occur? They tend to occur at divergent plate boundaries, such as the ones we just saw on a map with Iceland. They tend to occur at convergent plate boundaries, which is how you were able to get island arcs such as the islands of Japan and they can also form where you have two plates coming together and you have an oceanic plate and a continent plate and typically what happens in here is this plate is subducting you're gonna get a lot of ocean water that's gonna be in here as well it gets trapped and ocean water actually tends to um, lower the melting point of rock and so your less dense rock tends to melt out earlier than your more dense rock and again if it's less dense it's going to rise and if it can make it to the surface you're going to get eruptions you're going to get volcanoes being formed 
Now let's talk about hot spots. A lot of people ask, well, what are hot spots? Is it a spot that's just hot? Is it the place to go to get the best sale? You know, that's the hot spot to get, you know, fleece jackets if you want to get one? No. We're in geologically a hot spot and I have behind it the Hawaiian Islands because the Hawaiian Islands are a perfect example of a hot spot. A hot spot is a portion of the Earth's surface that experiences volcanism due to a rising mantle plume. And the hot spot is fixed within the mantle while the plate continues to move. And one of the best examples of this are the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands were basically created because of a hot spot. And so when we look at the big island of Hawaii right now, it was created because of a hot spot, as was Maui and all the other ones. Now, there's actually a new island coming up, and they actually have it here. If you can see this, it's Loihi. And maybe in, in a little while, not a couple of weeks, not a couple of months, but scientists theorize it's going to happen in millions of years. Um, eventually, this volcano will break the surface, and it might be a new island of the Hawaiian chain. So if you look down here at the bottom, what happens is the plate moves. And the plate's moving in this direction. But this mantle plume stays put. This does not move. So the pl plates move. This stays put. So Luihi is forming right here. And eventually Luihi will be right over the mantle plume. And it's going to have more eruptions. It's going to put out more magma. And it's going to create a larger island. And when we look at the next slide, you can actually see this long chain. So geologists theorize and believe that this long chain was all created by the same mantle plume. So the plate's moving in that direction while the mantle plume is staying put. And this is one of those things, you're going to have an assignment where I'm going to have you figure out the direction of this. A lot of students will theorize because this is older and this is newer, they theorize that the plate moves in this direction, but it's actually the opposite. The plate's got to be moving in the other direction because this stays put and the plate moves over it. So the older stuff must have been there first. This is here last, so it moves in that direction versus this other direction. And this is interesting. If you look at a map, you can see this is where the island chain points to. But at some point in time, the plate must have shifted because scientists are now theorizing that this was also created by the same mantle plume. So the plates must have been moving in a more northerly direction. And for some reason, the plate shifted. So it's a little bit of evidence that, yes, plates can shift. They can move at different rates. We know that, but they can also move in different directions. The convection currents probably change over time. And so here we see all these different hot spots around the world. So there's, there's lots of hot spots. There's not just one. There's not just uh, Mount St. or not Mount St. Helens, but there's not Mauna Loa here in Hawaii and the other ones. We have one right here in the United States called Yellowstone. And eventually, you know, it may move in this direction. So many, 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 many years down the road, if they still call it Yellowstone, it's going to be much, much closer to Wisconsin. Now, we're going to take a quick break here before we start on with Section 2. That way, you don't have to sit through the entire set of notes all at once. Again, as always with this part, if you have any questions, just ask your science teacher. They'd be happy to help you out if you have any questions about any of the things that we talked about in this first section. Thank you, and goodbye.